Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Peart, and welcome to the Salty Science Podcast. So in the last episode, we talked about the sun being the largest source of light in the ocean. And I mentioned that the light from the sun gets attenuated or diminished very quickly the deeper you go due to the light being absorbed and scattered by all the different particles in the water as well as by the water molecules themselves. And the light levels or intensities attenuate exponentially until you reach a depth where there is absolutely no sunlight. And marine scientists have divided the ocean into three zones based on ambient light levels. You have first the euphotic zone, which is the region of water that has plenty of sunlight for things like visibility and photosynthesis. And then we consider the bottom of the euphotic zone to be wherever the light level is 1% of the light level at the surface of the water. And then where the euphotic zone ends, the dysphotic or twilight zone begins. And in this region, there's a tiny very tiny bit of sunlight, but there is still some sunlight. It's not completely dark. And different fish and other organisms take advantage of this amount of light. And then as you continue further deeper into the ocean, you have the aphotic or midnight zone where there is absolutely zero sunlight. But even though there is zero or no sunlight, is there still light? As my grad school advisor, Mark Brush, would jokingly say, you betchum. In other words, yes, there is definitely light in the aphotic zone, it's just not coming from the sun. And that is exactly what we're going to be discussing in this episode, all the different types of light in the ocean that doesn't come from the sun. Okay, so now here's a quick disclaimer. Obviously, there's anthropogenic or human sources of light in the ocean, such as lights from marinas and docks and boats and submersibles. And of course, when I go on night dives, I always bring underwater flashlights with me, as do other night divers. But in this episode, we're not going to talk about these anthropogenic or human sources of light. So with that said, let's start talking about these other sources of light. And so to begin with, one of the other sources of light in the ocean comes from underwater volcanoes and ridges as really hot molten lava emerges from beneath the Earth's surface. And I found this really great YouTube video from NOAA showing underwater volcanoes occurring in the ocean. And in this video, you can see the light that's emitted. It's really cool. And I've already posted the link of this video on the Salty Science Weebly website on the special links page. So make sure you go check it out. But as you can imagine, volcanoes are not continuously erupting. They're ephemeral or they're short-lived and only occur in specific or special places. And obviously, as you can imagine, some of the light gets extinguished as it hits the cold water of the deep ocean. And there's so many things that I could say about underwater volcanoes that I'll save that for another episode. But don't forget to check out the YouTube video link that I posted. All right, so now it's time for my favorite source of light in the ocean, and that is bioluminescence. Woohoo! So first question, what is bioluminescence? Well, bioluminescence is this really cool chemical reaction that produces light within living organisms. And it's a similar process to chemiluminescence, which is also a chemical reaction that produces light such as when you play with glow sticks. A glow stick is composed of two liquids kept in separate chambers, and when you bend a glow stick so that the inner chamber cracks or breaks open, the two liquids can combine. And when the two liquids combine, they produce light, which now, honestly, I wanna go play with some glow sticks. Oh wait, I have some glow sticks. Okay, here, hold on, pause. Okay, so I'm back with glow sticks in hand here. And so when I crack them, the two liquids are able to combine. And when they do, they react. And one of the byproducts of this reaction is light. So here we go. Ooh, pretty. And it glows. That's so cool. Okay, so anyway. So some animals are also able to produce similar chemical reactions that produce light. And when a living organism produces this type of reaction, we call it bioluminescence. And you may be familiar with this concept if you've ever seen fireflies at night, especially during the summer. And there is so much that I could say about bioluminescence right now, especially when it comes to the ocean, that it really deserves its own episode. So stay tuned. Okay, so next question. So where in the ocean do we see 
this bioluminescent source of light? Well, we actually see bioluminescing creatures in all three zones, the euphotic, dysphotic, and aphotic. But probably the most famous region for bioluminescence is in the aphotic zone. And if you've ever seen the Disney Pixar movie Finding Nemo, you'll recall the scene where Marlin and Dory find themselves in the pitch blackness of the aphotic zone. And then all of a sudden, they see this small beam of light that they try to follow which then ends up, of course, being attached to this really ugly and scary looking fish, which is actually an angler fish. And of course, there are so many different types of fish and organisms that bioluminesce in the deep sea that we'll definitely get into this in more detail in future episodes. And so, like I mentioned before, the aphotic zone is probably the most famous region for having bioluminescing creatures, but there are animals and organisms that produce this bioluminescence all throughout the water column, and they range in different sizes, from bacteria to the microscopic dinoflagellates that are responsible for the glowing waves as seen by many a tourist in Puerto Rico and even here in Virginia, to shrimp and fish and octopi to jellies and so many other creatures. And I will say this, my personal favorite bioluminescing creature is the flashlight fish. Actually, it's bacteria that live in a special sac beneath this fish's eye that produces the light, but the fish is able to control when the light turns on and off by using a special covering or lid for the sac. And flashlight fish just look really cool. They're rather small, but the shape of the pouch under their eye when it's illuminated make them look super fierce. Kind of like a little fish with a big attitude. And now that I think about it, it also kind of reminds me of Robin from Teen Titan, if you're familiar with that cartoon series. But anyway, Anyway, okay. The last comment I want to make on bioluminescence right now is that the light levels or intensity as well as the duration of the light can greatly vary depending on the size and number of organisms as well as the purpose or the reason why these organisms produce these bioluminescent reactions. Some of them use it to lure and prey like in Finding Nemo, but others use it to attract mates or just to recognize each other. And then some even use it as a warning signal or to illuminate their predators. And then of course, when it it comes to intensity, if you just have one little angler fish, that one fish might not produce a very bright light. But if you have millions and millions of dinoflagellates in the surface of the water, they can light up a whole beach. And don't worry, I will be posting pictures on the Salty Science Weebly page, so make sure to check them out. All right, so now it's time for our one minute summary. Okay, so in this episode, we reviewed the three zones in the ocean based on light levels from the sun. The euphotic zone, the dysphotic or twilight zone, and the aphotic or midnight zone. But there are other sources of light in the ocean as well. There are obviously anthropogenic sources of light such as from boats, docks, submersibles, and even nighttime divers who dive with flashlights. But in this episode, we only focused on natural sources of light. And we talked about two main natural sources of light, underwater volcanoes and bioluminescing sea creatures. And when it comes to underwater volcanoes, the magma that comes out of the Earth's crust is so hot that it produces light, and there have been some great marine scientists who have been able to capture this on film for all of us to enjoy. And when it comes to bioluminescing creatures, they generate chemical reactions that produce light similar to glow sticks. And these creatures are found in all three light zones in the ocean and come in very different shapes and sizes. And they use bioluminescence for very different purposes, such as luring in prey and even attracting a mate. And that is the end of our one minute summary. Okay, so now for the big question. Why do we care? Well, I guess it all depends on the way you look at it. If we're looking at underwater volcanoes, if we're able to see the light, then we know it's going to be very hot water. But it also means that new nutrients are going to be released into the water, which could mean that a new ecosystem could be supported, as well as possibly different fishing industries. And give a volcano enough time, you're looking at some prime real estate in the future. Just saying. And if we're looking at fish who are bioluminescing, often it's related to survival or attracting a mate, which then means that the species will thrive and also means that different food webs will be supported which then also means that you can enjoy that super delicious seafood dinner tonight. And then when it comes to dinoflagellates, especially this one particular species that I study, which is very toxic, it tells me something about what's going on in the water. And so for instance, if I see glowing water in my area, as pretty as it is, I know to stay out of the water. And okay, now I'll ask you, are there other reasons why we should care? And don't forget to send me your answers to saltysciencepodcast at gmail.com because I'd love to hear what you have to say. Okay, so that's it for now. Until next time, don't forget to stay salty.
Thank you for listening to Salty Science. But guess what? You don't have to let the fun end here. Go to www.saltysciencepodcast.weebly.com where I've posted some cool videos, my study notes, and some really neat experiments that you can try at home. And if you want to follow along with my own research, you can follow me on Instagram user handle Teps Adventure. That's T-E-P-S Adventure. All Salty Science episodes are available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcast, and YouTube, plus a number of other podcasting apps. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes as this is the best way to spread the word about this podcast. Salty Science is listener supported, so if you would like to show your support, visit our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash salty science, where you can either make a one-time donation of any amount or join the Salty Science crew for as little as a dollar a month. So visit the Salty Science Patreon and sign up today.